Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. So we're looking at part two of the tares and the wheat. But before we go into that, something that's really been on my heart the last couple of days is the Lord's words in Matthew 24. There's a lot in there, but particularly when he gets to about 19, he says, he says, Woe to those who are carrying a baby in the womb or are giving suck if they have to flee in those days. And that's been really churning around in my mind because I think every one of us would agree here and even those on the YouTube that we are in the final battle in a lot of ways between light and darkness. We're really in that final battle where, which, which Jesus referred to prophetically as the harvest. That time where the wheat and the tares have grown up and we're now having to deal with the fruit of the choices of sin. As well as the fruit of good as well. So we're seeing a world that is being, in many ways, overrun by evil. The hells have more influence today than they have previously for a long time. And that's having an effect on us. And that's what this passage is talking about. Woe to him who is carrying a baby in the womb or giving suck in those days if they have to flee. Now, the fleeing there is fleeing from sin fleeing from evil and carrying a baby in the womb means that the Lord has put you've just begun spiritual loves growing in your life and they're always coming in cycles right so what we were working on 10 years ago should now be mature a young boy a young girl standing strong in our life but the things that are being planted today are in many ways new infantile Immature is what the Lord's saying. Woe to those who are dealing with immaturity in their spiritual walk when you are in the battle. And I want to read what Swedenborg says about that here in a, in a minute. Because if you think about it, think about it like tennis <coughs> or football or some other game, you have to play it on a court or a field, don't you? And that field has rules. Well, a lot of these parables talk about the field. And the field is the human race. And the rules are the seeds that are being planted there. So we're either receiving the seeds of heaven into us and acting on them, or we're receiving the seeds of evil and we're acting on them. And when people act on evil, that gives power to the hells to operate on this planet to some degree, in our lives personally and in a more social sense. Now I'll say one last thing before I read what Swedenborg says here, and that is, there's always going to be this danger or balance in our life. <clears throat> the most important thing for us to get is the inner sense of the word. <clears throat> because that's what gives us application to take the very next step the Lord's asking us to take. That that inner sense is the most important. But the external or literal is still very, it's still important. And you can go too far where you neglect what the Lord is saying about the external world because you're so focused on internal things. And you can go the other extreme where you're literalizing the word to the point that all you're doing is looking out there and judging people and not dealing with stuff inside you. And so it's always going to be this balance between saying, Lord, what is this in me? And how do I now navigate a world out there? Yeah? So the harvest is going to be happening inside of you. Again and again, there'll come points where you come into a spiritual battle. We all know what that is. A spiritual battle. And we either need to be mature or if we're carrying something or giving suck, we're going to lose it. It's going to abort. We're going to miscarry. Woe to those who are carrying or giving suck in those days. And here's what Swinburne says. Woe to them who bear in the womb and give suck in those days. These chapters treat of the consummation of the age, which means the end of the church when there is a last judgment. Now, before I go on, Swedenborg clarifies elsewhere that a judgment there just means reordering. It's the end of the church age because the church has become dysfunctional 
And so the Lord needs to bring judgment or a reordering. Sheep over with sheep, goats <coughs> over with goats, good needs to be protected, evil needs to be shunned or fleed. That's kind of what he's saying. And that's what we're going through now. He says, Therefore those that bear in the womb and those that give suck in those days over whom there is lamentation mean those who then are receiving the goods of love and the truths of such good. Those who are bearing in the womb mean those who receive the good of love. Those that give suck mean those who receive the truths of that good. For the milk which is given signifies truth from the good of love. It is said, Woe to them, because those who receive goods and truths are unable to keep them. This is the key. The time for dibbling and dabbling with sin is over. We're living in, in, in our most difficult time in history and there's been the, the love and the grace of the Lord is there. Blessings. Hello, Dr. Noel. Come in. No, no, it's good. Come in. The, the time for dibbling and dabbling, you know, for being a child, yeah. the, the time for being a child is, is, is over. The time is now to learn to become mature in what the Lord is saying because the wheat and the tares are growing into fruit. And if we don't get this right, we're going to lose something in our spiritual walk. So here's what he goes on to say. He says, They are not able to keep them. Woe to them, because those who are receiving goods and truths are unable to keep them. For in such a state, hell is prevailing, and it snatches away the goods and truths, and thence will come profanation. And we never want to profane. That's the worst thing we can do. Hell is then prevailing because at the end of the church age, the falsity of evil is ruling and it takes away the truths of good. For man is held in the midst between heaven and hell and before the last judgment, that which arises out of the hells will prevail over that which is coming down out of heaven. Pretty heavy stuff, you know, what the Lord's saying there. But what he's saying to us is, come on. Don't muck around anymore. There's been grace and mercy in your life that when you've dibbled and dabbled with sin and you've gone, oh, that didn't do any real harm in my life. But now these tears are coming up and they're going to produce fruit. And the law of this world is that whatever's producing fruit must be allowed to produce fruit. So there is the law of sin and death. There's your tears. And then there is the laws of God's kingdom. There's your wheat. And the Lord is allowing both to come up and we need to have the fortitude and strength to be able to stand in what is right when we're all feeling this pressure. Are we not? I'm not the only one feeling this pressure, am I? I know other people are really feeling it. We're all really feeling it. But before I go on, let me ask you this. Last week, we had the sermon, Mark and the Messiah, and I threw the challenge out to us. Remember to get in that boat alone with the Lord. Get in that boat alone. Can anyone tell me you know, I, I know a few people have had pretty rough weeks, really rough weeks. <laughs> We're all nodding. W- was it helpful? Did you find yourself jumping in a boat? Did you find yourself retreating into a boat, trying to find some way to capt- capture a moment with the Lord? If you didn't, that's okay, because my job here is to encourage us to do that. Hmm. Did you have an okay week, Dale? <coughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, the innocence of children, the Lord's love and mercy. So, Jane, how was your week? Did you find a moment to grab a boat with the Lord? Yeah, I think I was. I was trying to share it more with Chris. So, I probably, yeah. I, that was your boat? You were trying to get in the boat with him and sort of have a time, a moment? Yeah, but I probably needed to get in the boat just myself. <coughs> yeah. Well said. I think as well. Yeah, that's well said. Often we can help others and we haven't first strengthened what's in us and, and, and it gets torn down. Ian, was your week okay? Did you find yourself jumping in a boat at any time? I do do last thing in the day. Yeah, the last one of the yeah, day. I sit on the edge of the bed before I swing my legs into the bed. I just... <coughs> a couple of minutes thinking about what's happened and if it's outstanding... Me, then I, um, pray about it. 
Ian, I had this picture, as you were saying that, of being in Paris and Ian getting in one of those boats and the guy just sort of rowing him down the, the, the river with the Lord. He said, you know, what a way to end the night. Yeah. Just get in one of those boats and just go for a row down the, the rivers of Paris with the Lord, you know. <laughs> Venice, sorry, not Venice, Venice, thank you. Venice. What was that? A gondola. A gondola, thank a gondola. you. It just kept, that was what was flooding my mind as you were talking about these times where you try to stop with the Lord at night. I'm going to see Ian in a gondola in... Venice. 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 <laughs> Paris, not Paris. <laughs> Paul, how was your week? Was it okay? Did you have any moments where you needed a retreat? I'm very busy. Um, but yeah. that certainly appreciated the analogy of, mm. uh, of getting in the small boats and, mm. uh, and, um, and the analogy between a small boat and prayer. Yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You offered. And, uh, Yes, I found that very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to hear. That's good to hear. Russell, how was your week? Yeah, I, I usually get up at five o'clock in the morning and try and do that, but I've been getting up at four, so I <coughs> felt as though I need to spend more time with that, so... Wow. Yeah, I enjoy it very much. Wow, you're catching the early fish. The really early fish. <laughs> and, and, and Sean and, and Sarah, have you had... Did you get a chance this week to sort of retreat with the Lord? Every day. <laughs> Every day. Oh, that's so good to hear. Every moment. Every moment. Please, Lord, help. <laughs> that's good to hear. That's beautiful. Dr. Noel, was your week okay? Did you find yourself needing to retreat? In fact, my son was in Venice last week. Venice? Yeah, my second son. And he was, he was in the boat and he was just enjoying his Venice. Oh. In the boat? Unfortunately, I, was, I didn't attend last week's service. But I think he represented in Venice. Oh, wow. Well, think of the, Venice, wow. the amazing connections there. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. My son and daughter-in-law from India, yeah, they went there. To Venice, wow. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. Well, let's, I'm going to quickly move through the parable, then we're going to jump over to get into part two. Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares on the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? From whence then has it tares? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then we go and gather them up? He said, Nay. That's why you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in the bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Did anything jump out at anyone this time we've read it through? Yeah, it did for me. Yep. Uh, let both grow in the harvest. Mm. It, it reminds me of a passage in Swedenborg where he says the Lord will not step in to prevent a temptation serving its purpose. Mm. He, lets it run. <coughs> he lets it run so that we see and experience and process the whole experience. Because if he kept jumping in, then we would never deal. We'd lose. We'd lose it. Then we. The good never becomes attached to us. That's right. We never get ownership. Yeah. I think what, what, what Ian's talking about is this need for our ego to own. Yeah. The Lord wants us to own the good, to feel as if it's our own, to live it, to love it, but acknowledge that it's his. And without the temptation, that never happens, does no, it? It doesn't. That's right. Uh, that's wonderful, Ian. I, I thought gather first the tears was jumping that that was jumping out at me the one you said but also first the tears you know it's the junk that seems to come up easy and most predominantly and you can feel like oh my life is a mess but be reassured the lord is first getting rid of the tears you're going to get to see the wheat and its fruit that's what we should hold on to when we're going through a difficult period I just wanted to share briefly, on the way to church last week and this week on the radio, um, I was listening to um, a story of 
he's actually he was actually ended up being a criminal, like quite um, an extreme criminal. So it had the first part of his story last week on the way to church, and then this week has been the second half of his journey, and he ended up in like a mental institution with like the worst of the worst criminals. Um, and he came out and from prison and was with a whole lot of prisoners and wanted, somebody came and killed his dog. <gasps> so he wanted a hitman. <sighs> and the hitman that he rang came and arrived and he had found Jesus. <laughs> and so ministered to him. And it's interesting. So he accepted Jesus, but he wasn't allowed to move away with this man and in his community so he was still stuck in the house with these other prisoners and ended up going back into crime mm. again so even though he had found jesus and got the seed yeah and, got the seed. and had been seeking because they had diagnosed him as being schizophrenic but he it was a spiritual battle like very evil. much yes yeah, so he knew that that was what his situation was and it's just interesting that even though he'd had that encounter with jesus and believed he couldn't change his life around at that time and he said he ended up going back to prison again and it wasn't until he was actually in a drug rehab group and was they all had to confront why they had, were the way that they were, which was rejection actually from their own earthly fathers, that there was a disconnect that he, yeah, that they did that sort of deep seeking and realised what had driven them in the direction that they'd driven, that they'd been seeking approval, that he then could find that his heart could have that proper change. And Which yeah. kind of goes back to the the first parable before this. The Lord in his wisdom, if I'm right, Jane, the Lord in his wisdom has kind of let this seed go in, yeah. but not let it germinate. Yeah. Put, put it deep, because if it germinated at that time, it would have been in rocky ground. It would have been not enough depth. So he's kind of had to wait, and then later on, when the right mechanism to support it was there... It was allowed to grow. And that does highlight the issue that the Lord, more than anything, doesn't want to lose the good seed, the harvest. Even let the tares live inside us at times in order to keep the good seed safe. Now, before I move on and read, is, was, that, was that it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Before I, mean, I move on and read. It's a pretty extreme story, I just want to, but really Oh, it's extreme, amazing. Yeah. amazing. I just want to ask Guang, because he's so quiet. How was your week, Guang? Did you find yourself retreating at all into a boat at any time with the Lord? Did you have a... Is there every morning what I can have? I translate some, some pieces of either the sermon we are studying this week or some writings of Swedenborg. <coughs> Recently, I'm, I'm translating our sermon. Yes. Yeah. The Holy Supper. Holy Supper. Mm. Okay. Uh, apparently, when I was translating, I needed to refer to the Bible, to the original book uh, of the writings, which give me uh, some some stimulation and uh, some surprise. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, currently, I'm thinking about uh, the linkage between the, the bread and the wine. Yes. And the lamb and the charity of the, of the Lord. Mm. And uh, because this sermon came, came, came with me some, some very good linkage, mm. which I didn't think before. Mm. Yes. Well, I took part in the, the, the Holy Supper so many times, and also the, the the pastor standing in front of us saying that this is my my my, my flesh. <laughs> okay, eat it. You will be with me. This is my blood. Yes. You take it. <laughs> but I I have never thought about it, about it, the internal meaning. Yes. I thought of the linking with the law. Yeah. And. Uh, why it is linked to the charity and love. And what is on earth? What we are doing? We are doing this, what is happening? 
between heaven and us. <coughs> that mm -hmm. is important. It is. In some church, some Christian believes the bread and the wine is holy. Mm. But this sermon told me the wine and the bread is itself is not holy. No. But it is a symbol to link our mind with the heaven. Beautiful. Guang, in many ways, Holy Supper is another one of those little boats. You know, we get in a boat with Jesus. The boat's not holy. It's Jesus. It's who's in the boat with you that matters. But it's that opportunity, it's that special little boat that gives you that opportunity to link. That's, that's where the power lies, the linkage. I like that word you're using, the link. The word religion, by the way, means to relink. To relink with God. Isn't that beautiful? The, 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 thing, the key thing is, if we are not uh, open our mind, we don't want to think about these things. We don't want to accept these yeah. things. Even, even though we read this statement, yes. it's nothing. We see it, we don't see it. We see it with our naked eyes, we don't see it in our mind. Mm. Couldn't understand it or couldn't accept it. That's very important. Very important. And that's the difference between, very difference between whether a, a good and a truth is going to give birth in your life and grow up and be strong or whether you lose it. Woe to those who are carrying or giving suck in those moments because you lose it. You often lose it. Lord, I pray that we don't lose your goodness and your truth, that it matures rapidly in our lives, that we grow up and we stand strong in the evil day and we see your victory in our life. Amen. So let's jump in. I'm, I'm not sure where we're supposed to be going from. I think let's just plow. You plow into some of these for us, uh, <coughs> Paul. Just start another parable and we'll try and get through the page quick. Sorry. Don't know where you are. Another parable there. Page two. Another parable he put forth unto them. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, Heavenly light begetting more heavenly illumination. Heavenly heat, begetting more heavenly affections. The kingdom of heaven states within the advancing soul where good and truth have united and the soul acknowledges the goods and truths as belonging to the Lord and not from self. There's your linkage, one linkage, united linkage. Keep, keep going. The kingdom of heaven is a state of bliss, joy and peace, resulting from union between the individual soul and the divine human, the Lord. To enable this union, the heart and mind needs to be prepared through spiritual practice. This work creates reception for the ingrafting of the word in its <coughs> seed form. The Logos, in its written form, offers us that seed. The word opened to its inner sense inside of the advancing soul is the uniting of the Lord to the individual. Keep, keep, yeah. It is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field, the Lord in the form of the word entering the mind and heart. But while men slept, Truths living in the memory, but not yet practiced, ritualistic worship with no real understanding, natural life separated from spiritual life. In the last book of the Bible, we are told to be watchful. Revelation chapter 3. The power to be watchful in spiritual terms requires us to first be awakened to spiritual processes. Spiritual knowledge abounds, and there are many who can expound spiritual subject matters, but regeneration requires a practice of truth, <clears throat> and not just a gathering in of spiritual information. Therefore, to have knowledge, but not practice, it is to be asleep, while being awake and watchful means we regularly practice the knowledge we have gathered. 
So thoughts and comments on that? What are people's... I'm thinking of Russell's early morning, four o'clock getting up, Ian's boat in the evening, Guang's translation work. They're all little, they're all little practices that are keeping us from being asleep. Would you agree? Yeah, there are passages in the Old Testament that watch me most of the night. And I, really every day, um, included amongst my prayer is a picture of a watchtower on the walls mm. of, of one of the ancient cities like Jerusalem. <coughs> and they used to take turns to be up there watching for any possibility of infiltration by enemy people, even of the night. So, uh, I, I, to me that means spiritual wakefulness. Wakefulness, beautiful. It's, it's to be, I pray to the Lord that <coughs> keep me watchful of things in my life or awaken me to things in my life that perhaps I'm inclined either to brush over mm. or to not really identify. You know, you've got to be up high to be a watchman. Yeah, tower. Yeah. tower. Isn't it so easy to get into autopilot? Yes. Autopilot. Yes. It's so easy. I, I want to open up to more, but before I do, let me share with you how I watch. Mm -hmm how I watch for the Lord, how I listen for the Lord and I watch for Him. I listen to my whole body. That is me listening to the Lord. Because in here I have this peace. It's deep. Often it can be very distant, but it's there. It's a light. It's a, it's, it's a lighthouse. It's there. It's glowing. And the more I focus on it, the more it pervades my consciousness. It's a peace. But as I listen, and I, I, I enjoy that peace of God, and I listen to my body, my body will tell me things. You know, maybe I had too much coffee, so you've got to be careful there. You know, you, 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 there is physiological things you're listening to as well. But listen to your body, and your, your body will tell you, the Lord will tell you when there's a movement over there, and it's not right. And you're in the tower, and you're looking, there's a movement over there, and it's not right. An enemy is approaching. You'll feel it in your inner being. Your body will tell you. Yes, Guang? <coughs> How do you listen to your body? Well, I'm listening to the peace. Mm. And when like, something... And when something is some meditation? Just always, continually listening to the peace. Just always trying to appreciate the peace of God. Continuously. I, I get into autopilot, and I might go an hour or two hours, and I go, oh, I was running on autopilot, totally ignoring my states. So I, I, I focus in and stay focused on that peace as much as I can every day, all day. And when something interferes with that peace, when my body is telling me something, I say my body, but I'm talking about my whole being, it's the Lord. My body's telling me something. And, and I mean, even when Ian was talking, my back was starting to, to ache because I learned to listen to what other people are feeling in their bodies as well. My back down there was aching. When Guang was talking, my arm was giving a slight ache for some reason. I'm, I'm listening to everyone and my body, and we're communicating. And in that, then I go to the Lord, and I say, what say you, Lord? I have a real anxiousness just come up in the last few minutes. What is that? What are you saying, Lord? And I talk to him. And it might take 10 minutes, it might take an hour, it might take two or three days. But eventually, I get a witness as to what, and confirmation as to what he's showing me. And, and then I pray. And then I get in that boat and I pray, <coughs> according to what the Lord's showing me. So this is an example of being a watchman. What you said is very important, very meaningful, because right. someone asked me whether Swedenborg's society or Swedenborg's system has a practical method to apply what he included in the writings yep. to our daily life. Very good. Yeah. Because see, people, at least some people, are seeking this practice. If the Swedenborg Society or the Swedenborg New Church can develop such system, yes, yes, it will be very, very useful. Yes. What you said is mm. very. 
at least a very very useful clue. Yes, Guan, I would I would say that 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 it's there. The system is there in the writings and in the church. But even we, as a traditional church, have slipped into preaching and teaching, which is okay. But we need more. We need training. Think about the difference. And Sacred Circle is one of my attempts to get us out of just preaching and teaching into training. So we're, we're, this is a good environment for me to talk about that. I can't stand up the front and do a sermon and talk about that guy. Kind of, well, you could, but it would not. It would have to be done very carefully, wouldn't it, Ian? You'd have to sort of do it in a way that... But this is the right environment for us to talk about these things. Now, let's go around the room quickly and see what other people do that keeps them watchful. Ian, you said it. You know, you, you stop at the end of the night and get in your gondola in your spiritual Vienna and you go down that beautiful, silky, smooth river with the moon up there and the guys rowing you down there and the Lord and you chat and you say Lord have I go today That's right. anything you want to point out to me Lord yes exactly. yeah so these are how we watch be watchful I'm trying to be watchful continuously because I'm then in states of peace and happiness more often as a result <clears throat> it's there and I build where attention goes energy flows so I'm focusing on the peace of the Lord as much as I can and when something interferes with it, I want to know what's interfering with my relationship with the Lord. So that's just one way. And Ian's getting in the gondola at night is, is another. What's some other ways that you stay watchful? Can think, uh, Dr. Noel? The mystic, uh, the, the, we, 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 we understand and study everything based upon our senses, eyes, ears, nose, touch. Yes. But the mystics, the religious and the mystic in the Swedenborg, I think that these are all not the, the five organs you know, which is uh, aware of the environment. The whole body, so as uh, Pastor has been telling, the whole body is conscious of the environment. And for us to perceive the environment, we need to be conscious to ourselves. That is, we should be attentive to every, every pores in the body. And every pores in the body is... Uh, connected to the environment. So if you read the books of uh, Helen Keller, right? yes. how did she perceive? <clears throat> right? Yeah. So the, the miracle worker, if you happen to see the film, I think we must I think, put it on and then see we should. how yes. without opening the eyes, you know, you can perceive the whole thing. So there is a power within us which is connected to the cosmos, yes. to the environment, yes. in and around. So even if you close Right? Sean sitting here, I will be able to perceive by closing my eyes. And if he comes closer and closer, I will feel his energy. Mm. Right? Because this is all, you know, how we, how we really practice our uh, meditative processes. So if our mind is not uh, diverted or you know, distracted anywhere, this consciousness is, uh, is full, like the bulb burning, mm. and you will be able to see. But then we need to tune that, as he said, the tantra. You need to tune it and then say, yes, I am fully attentive to myself. Yes. When I'm fully attentive to myself, I'm not divided, I'm not distracted. Then the consciousness of the environment always, you know, touches us, our lives. And we are aware. It is not necessary that we need to be there. For example, if his daughter is an American, then he can be conscious about what she's doing. If oh, only he ready. practices that uh, <laughs> power. Right? The power of you know transferring your energies to a distant place. Yes. And you this is what Edgar Casey has done it. That's called the sleeping well, problem. Well, Doctor, no, you, you, the, the clues are all there, because look at the Lord. He says he says, Be careful how you hear. Now, I read a passage like that and I go, tilt, tilt. Huh? Be careful how you hear? What what are you saying, Lord? But you know, Doctor Noel, uh, your energy is touching us right now when you're talking, because we're hearing you. But as you said, the five senses are, 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 are false. They're limited. Exactly. Yeah. So be careful how you hear, says to me. Don't just hear with the natural ear. Hear with the spiritual ear as well. So it's that much deeper, isn't it? It's much, much deeper. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. I think, like, with that sort of, some people might say that sixth sense type of thing. Or I ten think, senses. Yeah, yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, if we're looking at the addition, yeah, because you're looking at 
those five spiritual senses. eyes, spiritual smelling, yeah. spiritual taste, spiritual hearing. Yeah. Um, I think some people seem to be more like to have that as more of a natural skill. Like some people, if I'm thinking about sport, some people are more are better at sport than other people. Naturally, better at sport than other people. Um, but you can develop your skills to be better at it. Because I'm thinking that, yeah, for Chris, he can smell spiritual evil. things. Yeah, he yeah. can smell yep. evil. Yep. Um, and he can perceive, yeah, just he gets a sense of that, um, which is, yeah, not a skill. I mean, it might be a skill that. I do develop, but it's not something that I have developed at this point. Oh, I've definitely had periods of s smelling spiritual stuff. I'm sorry to interrupt, Jane, but it's mm -hmm. smelling. And it's, it's interesting that you, you uh, I tend to ha have more negative experiences smelling evil things. But like the parable says, first bring out the tears and burn them. <coughs> there is commonly a lot more negative energy than positive energy. But paying attention to that, not ignoring it, and going, what does that smell? It smells like sweat and urine and other things mixed together. And learning that that's spiritual, there have been experiences where I've smelled angels. And it's like roses and sweetness, and it's intoxicating. It's like, I want to smell more. And I'm not really smelling it with my nose, it's, but I'm smelling it. You know, like I've smelled angels, and it's not been that often that I've smelled that, much more than negative stuff. But you've got to start with what you've got, you know. And so, I, you know, Chris has told me that he's had that experience and I've gone, rather than poo-hooing it, I've gone, absolutely, this is very real what you're, what, you're, what you're doing there, Chris. Someone else said to me this morning, James, it's better to have a faithful man than a gifted man. That was Chris Atkinson. And I began to think about it. I said, that's so true, Chris. But, you know, God doesn't make a single soul without giving them a gift, really. So everyone has gifts, but just some people have learned to stir up that gift. So better is a faithful man than a, a gifted man. Because if you've got a faithful man, they'll figure out their gift eventually. And what you've got is a, bro is a brother in the battle. When you're in the battle and you're on the front line and you need someone to stand with you, you've got a brother that's going to stand, or a sister that's going to stand with you on that battle and fight with you. Not someone that's got a gift and then says, see ya, I'm out of here. Well, that gift's no good then, is it, to you? But, but thank, keep, keep going, Jane. I didn't mean to interrupt, but you're talking about the idea of... You know, Chris has had that and... and yeah, and, it, and I think what... Yeah, it's hard sometimes for people because they think, oh, um, we compare ourselves to what the giftings that other people have or how, you know, they exp um, spiritually experience things. And yet, that's not useful. We need to be building on what we currently have and our journey, which is different. In fact, I would students. say that if we don't start discovering what our gifts are, and I'm talking about us here, and using them and growing, there won't be a church. And, and I'm, I'm saying that with the confidence that the Lord is going to do that. But we, the time of preaching and teaching alone is gone. Now it's time for preaching, teaching and training and equipping and deploying people too. Be it's great, yeah. So Sarah and I, we were um, <laughs> used to be really in a society, in the celebrity society and the famous people around us and the, and the, and the money and the position and the be. But we are, most of the time we are feel it's uh, no peace, but uh, ah, we, yeah. uh, of course, as um, um, uh, I was quite quite famous uh, a pastor in Beijing City, in um, but uh, even though I speaking you know, the hundreds or thousand people in kind of in front of people laughing why or what what kind of a be be, <laughs> be almost be worship. But then, internally, we were still feel that uh, that's not us. It's not. Uh, we're looking for something with the Lord peacefully and uh, to quiet. Uh, so now we found that this is, you know, it's really, actually, 
<coughs> being a pastor, we're wasting many people. When we get somewhere, and we can sense that uh, the spirit. Yes. You know, sometimes we are feel where peace and it goes on, but sometimes we just feel that uh, no matter what environment, whether it's uh, in a home oriented or in a, in a society oriented, we just feel it's not uh, been, been uh, smoothly or, or yes. harmonized. And this is exactly what Jesus said when he said, when you go out into a house, let your peace go upon that house, and if it comes back to you, dust your feet off but you know we'll use the analogy of baseball here I know it's an American sport but if you're playing baseball and and, and the guy hits that ball he hits it hard and he hits it well but it's right on the line and you're not sure when I say on the line I mean it's right on the edge of the diamond and you're not sure was it in the diamond or was it out of the diamond because if it's in the diamond it's legitimate if it's out of the diamond it's it's not it's illegitimate Whose decision is it? Who ultimately makes the decision whether that ball was in or out? The umpire. The umpire! And there's a passage in the epistles, easy to miss, where Paul says, let the peace of God be the umpire in your heart. Isn't that interesting? You've got to follow that peace. Even if it brings you to an externally small not so famous or whatever, you know, like it, it, it might bring you down to a place of just real humility. I'm at peace with us being small for now. For now, you know, it's because the Lord doesn't do things unless he does them abundantly. <coughs> but what we've got to do, we've got to do well. We've got to, let, we've got to learn to let that peace be the umpire. Don't, you know, sometimes we, we, we let the natural eyes take us, the natural senses take us places we shouldn't go. No. And what do they tell us? They tell us, oh, that person's arrived. Look at the car and the house and the family and the wealth. But you peel that onion away a little bit and what are you going to find? Oh, well, the bank owns it all. And you go and knock on their door and get involved in their real life. And they're all happy and smiling when they're in public, but you knock on their door and go in there in the private time and they don't even like each other. They don't even enjoy each other's company and they're mean to each other. You know, these natural senses will lie to us. But the umpire in here won't. And you can, you can trust him. You, know, you can trust that peace. When, when you're around someone, you get peace. That's the Lord. His people. You know that you're with people who are, are doing the Lord's work. What were you going to say, Paul? I, I hope I, I can give you an analogy. Um, yeah, yeah. You can draw strength from your serenity. Last night um, at Suncorp Stadium, um, Would have been cold there. Oh, it was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's part of my point. Um, uh, you get up to go and lots of crap. So I was with a few blokes. I think we had a rough idea about getting the bus back to somebody's house or something. Um, and I was a bit slow up the stairs and I lost sight of them. <gasps> so the crowds and the crowds were going everywhere. And I, all these yellow hats and I just lost them. I thought, oh no. So the only alternative, it was well past my bedtime already, uh, I knew where the um, taxi rack at Suncorp was, so I, I managed to get my right the other end of the stadium. Uh, I, I asked the chap at the end of this very long line, uh, is this the taxi rack? <laughs> well, I hope so. Well, he told me it was, so I joined the line. Now, um, as you see, I'm a bit of trouble getting around, and I really can't stand for a long periods of time. No. Much preferred. Just can't do it. Um, but it was a beautiful, calm evening. Mm. Um, um, I'm old enough now to um, uh, not to panic about these things and um, <laughs> I was enjoying the fresh air. <laughs> the queue was calm and orderly. There was no issues. Uh, no issues. No, no uh, drunkenness. Sorry, no yeah. drunkenness. No. And we shuffled forward, and eventually, oh, I just, I just felt serene. Yeah. So eventually, beautiful. I got to the, um, uh, uh, the cab, came along, said, anybody coming to Kenmore? Somebody <laughs> hopped in the back, and oh, we did a little goodness. detour to let this woman out, and um, she said, that is on me. I said, no, that's all right. I said, no, no, it's corporate car. 
actually been on call for a box since <laughs> she played at the fair. Wow! I got home and uh, got to bed and had a, had a good... It was just in that queue there. I, I stood for an hour and a half. Hour and a half? Here's one of your boats. It's from uh, Serenity from... Uh, strength from Serenity. The calmness you, you, you felt in. <gasps> strength from Serenity. Uh, by all these people. That's good. At another time, I'd have been frustrated. Yes. Oh, come on. Just the cool air. The calmness in the environment, just waiting in line. Something had to be done. You had to get to the what target. You had to get good to the example. Goal. Yeah. An hour and a half. Goodness me! I don't know. Looking back, just last night, it, it went like a breeze. That long. Yeah, it's beautiful. So you are at peace with God. Well, I just just listening to yeah. it. Well, I, I, looking back, yeah. it made sense now. But he gave me strength to do what I had to do and stand and, all that time. And now we've got to look forward. So we can practice that when the next storm comes. You know, when the storm comes, we go, oh, that's right, I remember Paul's story. I'm just going to get into serenity and enjoy the moment with the Lord. <laughs> that's a beautiful story. Amen. Paul, would you pump us through a little bit more? We've got another... I don't mind going 10 minutes over today. Is that okay if we, go t we started 10 minutes late? We'll go 10 minutes over. Is that all right? Go on, Paul. Beautiful reading. I love it. Play us into a couple more pages. His enemy came and sowed. Mm-hmm. Selfish states deep within, the influence of evil spirits designed to steal heavenly fruit from the advancing soul. Mm -hmm. Tears among the wheat, the fruit of evil and false states, pain and suffering from selfishness, and went his way, dark and negative forces hiding from the perception of the advancing soul. But when the blade was sprung up, signs of spiritual growth, illumination concerning spiritual battles. As the advancing soul progresses and learns to be sensitive to the leading of the Lord, the soul warrior begins to emerge. Truth must fight against evil and falsity. The follower of the Lord learns the importance of spiritual battles and how to fight in the Lord's strength through the power found in the spiritual sense of the word. And the sleeping soul ignores or misses the signs of negative spiritual activity. They suffer unnecessary harm at the hands of evil spirits. The advancing soul, on the other hand, has built the spiritual watchtower and can spot the enemy's advances. Such souls spring into action under the direction and teaching of the Lord through spiritual perception. Oh, I'm blown away, Ian, at your tower analogy there. It came up. <laughs> oh, I, I, I mean, this was written a couple of years ago, <coughs> so it's just blown, blown out. Any, any comments or thoughts? Should we keep going, or do you want to pop in a comment? No? Keep going. It's beautiful. And brought forth fruit. Regenerative, regenerative states that produce peace, joy, love, and charity, etc. Then appeared the tears also, the revelation of the destructive nature found in evil and false states. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Truths and goods within, angels working with the states found inside the advancing soul. Sir, didst thou, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? Questions concerning divine providence and a searching for answer as to why something is occurring. I'll jump in there and say, you know, this line here particularly when we're questioning, when I'm observing peace being interrupted inside me, I'll go into a questioning state with the Lord. Or, maybe this is a better way of putting it, I'll go into a questing state with the Lord. So my questioning is the quest. Lord... Did you not give me peace? Why am I feeling this interruption with the peace right now? Ah, an enemy has sown a seed. Can we get to the root of this, Lord? Help me find out what's going on here. Why am I losing my peace? And sometimes I'll be praying because I'm being attacked directly. Sometimes I find through revelation, the Lord shows me I'm praying for someone else. And it's phenomenal when you get this revelation. You know, you, you start praying for someone and then you get a call from them later a day later or two days, oh, you won't believe what I was going through. Yes, I would. <laughs> but it, it, it's not, you know, 
it's this openness and questing. Don't assume that you know what it is. Something's got in the way of your peace and your job now <coughs> as a warrior is to get the peace back in again, is to eliminate, watch from the tower, eliminate whatever is interrupting that peace. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Keep going. Any other comments or thoughts on that? Yes, okay. I, I, I'm thinking there's a sentence, his enemy came and the soul. Mm. Mm. That means the evil spirit still heavily fruit from the advancing soul. My question is, to from the Swedish writing, we know that when we are getting closer to the law, yes. the temptation is much more strong. Yes. Correct, correct? Yes. So, when we are getting closer to the law, the, the temptation is much severe. Mm -hmm. What is the appearance or what is the experience people may feel when he's experiencing much stronger temptation? More doubt about the Lord, about a lot of mercy, about a lot of help, yeah. or more more difficulty to, 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 to overcome, to experience? It will be different for each individual, Guang. It really will. It'll be different. <clears throat> if you think about it, the seeds that the enemy have planted. This, uh, Jane, you told us an incredible story of a man who had the godly seed planted, but it had to lay dormant for quite some time. Well, the evil seeds do too. It's, it's just a, it's, it goes in and it's a belief system and you've held on to it and you didn't know you were holding on to it and it's a false belief system and it's not bothering you right now. But then as, the, as you get closer to the Lord, Guang, I saw the dirt being dusted away. And the thing about a seed is it's got to be at the right depth for it to germinate. If it's too deep, it won't germinate. If it's too close to the surface, it burns. But, you know, as we get closer to the Lord, you could say the soil is being dusted away and then suddenly, poof, the seed springs to life. And when it's a negative seed, well, then you'll start having all the experiences of it. So it could be, what have I done, Lord? Where did I sin? Where did I go wrong? Why am I going through this? What have I done? <coughs> or it could be, if, this, if there really is a God, Surely he wouldn't do this to me. He wouldn't do that to me. You know, <laughs> you just look like, go on, you take over. No, I'm not going to take over. Um, well, it just occurred to me that the more intense the temptation, yes. I'm thinking of Jesus on the cross. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, he, he despaired that God was... Like just Eli, said. Eli, Lama, Sabachthani. Where are you, Lord? Where are my you? God, my God, why that are you was, forsaking me? very intense yeah. temptation. The greatest of his temptations was to feel that God was not there after all. Forsaking him? He's oh. forsaking him. Oh. And that's a real indication of the intensity of the temptation you're going through. Uh, you compare that to times when you're temptations are rather on the surface but to feel as Jesus did that he was to feel that you're forsaken yes what's life all about you know Jesus came to the point and said look I've failed wow you know, what was it all about he would have had feelings of really failing absolutely yeah yeah so Guang early temptations are more intellectual good point much more intellectual but the deeper temptations, where the will is being changed and transformed to the image and likeness of Christ, of God, it is so much more visceral. It is, it's yes. to your gut. It's to your core. You, you know, so you want to be encouraged. You're going through real bad battles. Then you're really making progress. Right. You're making real progress. And, you need, and this is where we need each other. We need, we need to turn to each other. Absolutely. Because M Moses, here he is using the analogy of the scriptures. Moses is out on the battlefield holding up the rod and they're winning. And then he collapses and they start losing. So Aaron and... Her. H-U-R. Hate you or her. Aaron and her come to his side and they lift up his arms. We need brothers and sisters that will come to our aid and lift up our arms when we are collapsing. I mean, there's a picture of the cross right there. They're holding up your arms in your, your terrible battle. Yep. So you can endure and come through. And it is so worth it. When you get to the other side, you find lasting peace. <coughs> lasting peace. If you run into the enemy, if you run from the Lord at that point, 
you're just going to have to six, 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 six recurring. You're going to have to keep going over spiritual battles, never coming into seven, the day of rest. It's interesting you say that because it reminded me that when the high school students revolted in South Africa in the late 1970s, 600 were shot by the police and killed. Wow. Out of a... Anyhow. Several of them were in the new church. Oh, dear. And later on, one of them, now married with two children, came and stayed with us for several weeks in Sydney. And I asked him about it. And he said, if we run, the danger was we were going to get shot. We quickly learned to turn and face <gasps> the police. Beautiful. And when the police saw you face to face, they hesitated because you're a person then. Oh, wow. But this is the 600 went. They've got a huge memorial for it through Soweto. And I just couldn't help that jumped into my Wow, mind. that's amazing, Ian. Face the enemy. Having Don't done all else to stand, stand there for an the evil day. Stand. stand. <coughs> yeah, turn that's amazing. Face. Wow, that's amazing. And we've got five more minutes. I don't know if Paul can carry us through. You're doing such an amazing job there, Paul. I think we're going to... Where, where do we get to? I think we're going to have to have a third session. Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's good. Go on, give us one more reading. Where, where are we up to? But um, we must remember where we finished. So we... Um, the servants, on. isn't it, down the bottom? Uh, from whence hath it tears? Yeah. Then hath it tears. The quest to discover the origins of evil and selfish states discovered within. That's our quest. Mm -hmm. We're a soul warrior and our quest is to, is to find these, these evils in us and we will find treasures at the same time. When we find the evils and falsities lying in us, we also find the treasures. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. A revelation coming from the word exposing evil spirits and their devices. Amen to that. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? The truth and goodness present within the advancing soul seeking to eradicate a work <coughs> of evil. But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. A further revelation causing peace and assurance that evil will be eradicated in a way that will not harm any of the good and wholesome process. And, and I don't mind jumping in there again and saying, <clears throat> back to my own spiritual experiences of being a watchman. Nearly always, nearly always, when I come out of you know, listening to my body and it's not in state of peace, and come back into the peace, and I go, I almost did nothing then, Lord. All I did was, was pray, seek you, get some insight, and pray according to that insight. <coughs> and truly the work is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. And, and so the longer I've been doing this, the more I'm in an awe and appreciative of how easy the work can really be. That it is the Lord's battle. We just have to do our part to stand. And it's just so encouraging to see how many... Uh, Ian and I are often talking... For years we've been talking about things unfolding within the church and in the society, and, and we discuss things. And, then, and often we'll say, oh, let's put, it, let's put it down. Let's just see what the Lord does. And so many times the Lord fixes it. And he fixes it so well. You know, he fixes it so well. So much better than, than man can with all his devices. <laughs> but be encouraged that, you know, that... that Often we want to get in and uproot everything. And the Lord's like, well, slow down. I showed you this. Now pray and watch the Lord do his work. And that's a challenge, isn't it? To step back and let the Lord take over when, when we just want to get in and uproot, pull and uproot. Ian? Well, I'm thinking as well, Darren, that as you say, they just wanted to pull the whole lot out. Yeah. Whereas... Our experience is that it's usually just one at a time, one or two at a time. We want to burn it all down, don't we? We want to get the other ones. <laughs> burn it all down. There's a sort of a, an impatience there with yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, but th that doesn't work to be, you know, for, for good fruit to come to the surface. It doesn't work to 
to just go impatiently at it. Yeah. And we become very disappointed and we become very frustrated because we don't really change a lot. If we think we're going to pull it out all at once, it, 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 it doesn't really bring deep change. And we need to be encouraged. This is the angels wanting to rip it all out. That's the goods in us and the truths in us that want to rip it all out. So, well, like the goods don't all mature at the same time, and we can be impatient with that as we well. Can. That we want it all to be. I want it all now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, notice that we, that's beautifully said, James, because notice that we begin here at the introduction, just back to the introduction, first line. Regenerative processes are cyclic. Thank you. Meaning that the advancing soul will undergo many such cycles right. in the overall process of regeneration. We're going to be back here at the Wheaton Tears many, many times. Today, I just wanted to really lift it to a, 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 per, a personal but social level because we all know the world is in an upheaval at the moment and my point for that was to say listen these battles are going to seem like they're getting more and more intense for you they really are but be encouraged the Lord has overcome these things and the hells are allowed to do more things because people have chosen bad things you know and so just be encouraged it's going to get a little more intense but we win in, in, the, in the Lord we win John chapter 16, right at the end. In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Amen to that. I've overcome, I've overcome the world. Be of good cheer. Be encouraged also, the Greek means there. Be encouraged, yes. Be encouraged. I've got the keys. I've got the keys to this problemed world. Yeah. I've got, I've got them. I've got the keys is what Jesus yeah. is saying, yeah. It's a beautiful well, shall we just say a prayer at leave it there? Is there any other thoughts or comments we want to sort of, before we move into a prayer? We can... We'll, we'll do a part three. <laughs> That's all right. That's okay. It's, uh, it is a great parable, isn't it? It's just it a wonderful... In fact, this week I was working on the blind lead the blind, and it, it came up as... It's two parts as well. And in there, I couldn't help but see how much this parable of the tares and the wheat influenced my understanding of the blind leading the blind. Because the thing about blindness is... You, you can't see what things are. I've got some friends who threw some clucker-tucker. They call it clucker-tucker out on the ground. <coughs> Their chickens are uh, they're about 10 chickens in a, in a run. And just out on the open backyard, they threw this clucker-tucker. And they said, come look at this. All of these plants came up, thriving plants. And there was... Um, bok choy and there was mustard and there was uh, rocket and silver beet and kale and massive broccoli is about to sprout out and, and I'm looking at all this I'm picking some and eating it and they're going I've got no idea what this is no idea isn't it nice and green and all you know nice and green chickens will love it and I'm going you've got a harvest here that people can eat <laughs> let alone the, the clucker tucker you know the chickens but it just made me think you know how often are we going through these experiences where the word is in us doing things and the evil is in us doing things and we're just kind of blind to what's going on and and i'm by no means a green thumb i'm learning and i've been learning for years but it, i was encouraged that i could identify most of what was in the clucker tucker and it just how often are we going along and not identifying what's in here right you know and, and and going that's good leave that that's a weed pull that or if the Lord St. Paul's it, you know. So just be encouraged by all of that. Be, be encouraged. What a wonderful uh, parable, isn't it? And, and a wonderful group to be sharing with. Let's, let's just say a prayer. Just say, uh, Lord, Lord, we love you. We love you. And we trust you. And we trust you. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. In times of confusion. In times of confusion. In times of despair. Teach us the secret place. That special secret place of peace with you. Take me there, Lord. Hide me there, Lord. So I can ride through the storm. Amen. Yeah. Any final thoughts or coffee maybe? Or <laughs> coffee, yeah. Thank you for recording, Guang. Once again. Hey, thank you for joining us, Jordan. Are you still there? Great. Oh. You still there, John, darling? I'm still here, yeah. yeah.